Hi, I'm Doug Keck, and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark, a special international bookmark as we go to Rome to speak with author Father Joseph Roche, who's the Vicar General, MIC's, uh, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. His book is about Rome, A Pilgrimage with Mary, and it's published by Marian Press. Always great to see you, Father Joe. How are you? Great to hear you. To see you as well, Doug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And of course, people recognize you all the time from uh, every year when we do the event from Stockbridge over the many, many years. You did a program, uh, Seneca of Mercy, as well. And of course, we talked uh, not that long ago about your Fatima book, right? Which was, th was that the first in a That's series right. of these That's kind right. of coffee table books? Exactly. We did the Fatima book, and uh, now the Rome book is the second one in this uh, line, and then uh, hopefully in the future we're looking forward to one coming out on the shrines of Our Lady in France. Right. Now, these are beautiful coffee table picture books, etc. Now, I notice uh, our dear friend, our, uh, you know, uh, Joan Lewis, features prominently in, in writing the forward. Now, how long have you known Joan, and how did you get her to do the forward? Well, I've been living in Rome for 14 years, but I knew that Joan was here for a long time. I think she's been here for 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, since I was always interested in uh, media and TV, as soon as I got to Rome, I said, I've got to meet Joan Lewis. So we went out for coffee, and every year she comes to our house for our uh, annual celebration of the uh, Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. And so we became good friends over the years. Mm -hmm. And so when it came time to do this book, mm -hmm. uh, Joan had done a wonderful book on the, uh, the year, year of mercy and um, uh, also the Jubilee year. So I knew she knew Rome like the back of her hand. So I said, Joan, we want to do a book on images of Our Lady in Rome. I know some of the churches, but you know them all. Mm -hmm. So what would you recommend? So she helped me to fill out the list of the churches that uh, you see in this book. So she did a wonderful job giving me the uh, input on the churches. And then the foreword she wrote, I think she did a beautiful job. Right. She's a great writer. She knows Rome. And so she did a really nice job. Right, exactly. In fact, uh, that's why Joan's Rome, of course, uh, and Vatican Insider on radio for Joan. She writes here in the beginning that what has always struck me about Father Joe throughout our friendship is, and it will strike you as you read this book, is his love for the priesthood. What did you think when you read that? Well, I mean, <clears throat> she's very kind. Uh, I, I love the, the priesthood. I love the, uh, the religious life. I belong to the Congregation of Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and it's a double vocation. Mm -hmm. um, before I entered the uh, priesthood, I, I had worked as an actor, mm -hmm. and so I was always into communicating and, and uh, trying to uh, uh, put the word out there, but now I'm able to communicate the word of God. So I find it to be such a privilege to be able to, to take the scriptures, the word of God, communicate that with people. God wants to reveal himself to us, communicate himself to us, and he uses me in this, uh, in this work, so it's a privilege for me. And then I've always had a devotion mm -hmm. to Our Lady growing up, so uh, to be able to always bring Our Lady into uh, my ministry, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a privilege, and I'm, uh, it's a great blessing. Well, she wrote in the beginning, the pilgrimages and the role of shrines in the life of the faithful are, in fact, so important that we find five canons dedicated to this subject in the Code of Canon Law uh, in the section governing sacred places and times. And she goes on talking about how St. John Paul II uh, talked about it as being places of grace. Has that been your, uh, your experience as well? Well, when I was first ordained, uh, I was ordained in 92, and I worked in a parish in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and then right after that I was sent up to our National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And so I came to know about shrine ministry through the, working there, and uh, annually I remember we would go to a, a meeting of shrine rectors, and uh, we would get some input on uh, the importance of shrines, that in a shrine... Uh, um, the liturgy should be celebrated in a beautiful way, beautiful uh, proclamation of the Word of God, the, the music, the rites, everything should be done in a mm -hmm. powerful way because you can really reach people. Sometimes people don't go to their parishes or are afraid to mm -hmm. confess in their parishes, but at shrines they can find the Lord and sometimes rediscover their faith mm -hmm. and then they can get back into the regular life in the parish. Mm -hmm. So I think shrine work is very, very important work and uh, I have always found that it's a privileged place to uh, proclaim the Word. Well, he says the first shrine, the shrine par excellence, was Mary, the mother of God, sanctuary to Jesus for the first nine months. I thought that was an interesting insight that she put into this book. Well, when I was a seminarian, I had an opportunity to study in the Holy Land for six weeks. 
And the place where we stayed and studied the scriptures was Ein Karim, which was the place of the visitation and the place of the birth of John the Baptist. And so it was a privilege for me to, uh, to be able to go there and to discover the scriptures in such a wonderful place, to feel like I'm so close to Mary because she spent so much time there helping her cousin Elizabeth. And, to, to, uh, and she was pregnant at the time carrying Jesus. So what, what happened at that visitation was she brings Jesus into a situation there, the birth and, and the, uh, the uh, pregnancy of Elizabeth. And that's what Mary is inviting us always to do, to bring Jesus into every situation. Uh, so as Joan said, uh, the first shrine is Mary carrying Jesus in her womb, and Mary always wants to bring us to her son Jesus. She also makes the point, I rejoice in Father Joe's choices of churches for this beautiful pilgrim's guide, as most of them have also become my favorites over the years. And she mentions how you start off with St. Peter's Basilica and, in, uh, and starting on the outside with that mosaic of Mary. And that's the one that so many people are used to seeing. And I know, uh, I hate to say it, that our religious catalog even features a wonderful image, and it's one of my favorite as well. I'm assuming it's one of yours. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, it was interesting that uh, there was no images of Our Lady in St. Peter's Square, and so it was the Holy Father, John Paul II, who said, well, we have to remedy this. Mm -hmm. And so he placed that image of Our Lady in a very prominent place, uh, totus tuus, totally yours, which was his uh, motto. Uh, he wanted to give himself over to Mary in, in terms of entrustment and consecration, and he wanted that to uh, be the, the for the whole church, that we would always entrust ourselves to Mary and she's going to lead us to Jesus. And then I had a wonderful uh, discovery in writing this book that we have a beautiful image of Our Lady in our general house in Rome, and it was the Vatican um, Mosaic Studios. Mm -hmm. The same, uh, one of the same uh, artists who had worked on that one in St. Peter's also worked on one in our house, so that was a great connection. Right, and, and it's also, uh, it was, I think I'm reading right, named after the image of the Blessed Virgin painted on one of the few remaining columns from the original basilica. So there's a real connection back to the original St. Peter's, in fact, right? Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. It's um, Mary, Mother of the Church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Now, the other thing, she, she talked about something in the beginning here before we get into some of the specific uh, locations and some of the uh, beautiful images we'll get to show people. Uh, talks about one inscription you'll see in every single church in Rome and often dozens of times in a single church is D-O-M. What does D-O-M mean? You know, she wrote that in the uh, um, um, forward, and I remember reading that just a couple of weeks ago just in preparation, but now I'm drawing a blank on it. So. Uh, it's basically Deo Optimo Maximo, in God the best and greatest. That's right, that's right. Always, uh, the, the beautiful thing about the churches in Rome are they're sort of like a, a catechesis in, in visual form because a lot of the people in the early uh, church did not have uh, the uh, education uh, that we, people would have nowadays. Many Catholics are very well educated nowadays. Back then, they would learn about their faith through the uh, stained glass windows and through the mosaics and through the frescoes and the religious imagery. So. It was to take us from a difficult mm -hmm. uh, human experience here on earth. And nowadays we have uh, paved sidewalks. We can imagine back then at that time, mm -hmm. the people are walking through the mud, people are walking through difficult uh, situations. Near St. Peter's, there was uh, a, like a, um, it was like a, a swampland. There mm -hmm. was malaria, people were dying. It was all kinds of problems in Rome at that time. And so if you walked into a beautiful church and you saw these beautiful images, it's, it's like you're, you're stepping into heaven mm -hmm. and you're raising your mind and your heart to learn about God who is the greatest. So mm -hmm. God is, is leading us up to heaven by walking into these churches and seeing these beautiful images. Right, and she said, I've been thinking that perhaps we need M-O-M, Mom, Mary, the greatest mother as well there. So that was uh, Joan's little, uh, I guess her little joke in there as well. One of the things in looking through as That's we go right, through. That's right, but Mary always wants to lead us to Jesus. Right, exactly. And the, the idea and the beautiful pictures and for a coffee table book. And, and it dovetails into what you said earlier about beauty because it is something I would say, first of all, in Rome, uh, there are many things beautiful about Rome. There's many things that one could go and say, gee, this city could use a good cleanup in other areas uh, where you're walking along the streets and you know you go from, in a sense, like you're saying, this stark contrast of everyday kind of life and all of its difficulties uh, and then this kind of ethereal, heaven-like experience, this beauty that reminds us 
that this isn't all we're meant for, right? That's right. Well, you know, we were, I was talking about the mud there. Just uh, recently in Rome, uh, around Christmas time, uh, they weren't collecting the garbage. And so there was garbage all over the place. And so people would say that Rome is beautiful from about one meter or two meters up, mm -hmm. but don't look below that because <laughs> it's disgusting. Um, and so th it really does get, make you think about the sacred and the profane. We're mm -hmm. living in a world that uh, can, can be very messy and, and even pretty awful sometimes. And yet God w wants us to know that that is not all there is, that mm -hmm. we are made for greatness, that we are made for sanctity, we are made for holiness, we're made to be uh, find Jesus and find God right. in, in all things. And so that's why these beautiful churches with the beautiful images can raise our minds and elevate our minds above the, the things of this world. Absolutely, and that's why books like this that have such beautiful uh, imagery in them, beautiful photographs, uh, allow people maybe to take what they've seen already back home with them or for many who will never get the chance to experience these particular shrines or locations whether it's in Fatima or, or this particular book in Rome it gives them an opportunity to enjoy that and to touch some of that beauty I notice you got a plug in here as well on the uh, totus tuus picture uh, yeah, for one of your confreres there Father Michael Gately uh, has done a wonderful work in this crowd with his books, 33 Days to Morning Glory and 33 Days to Merciful Love. So uh, you're still responsible for making sure that the MICs uh, are uh, financially okay as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that idea of consecration and entrustment, I think, is so important. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that was important back at the time of Louis de Montfort. But then what Michael did, a wonderful job, was writing it in a language that people of today can understand and so that it becomes a timeless thing that lay, uh, Mary is always going to lead us to Jesus. She wants us to give our heart and, uh, and give our whole selves to Jesus. So that idea of consecration and entrustment is a timeless idea and uh, it needs to be always uh, ever new. Right, and the first one after St. Peter's we move into, which I know we have some images are, uh, are St. Mary Major. And we hear that a lot because the, uh, the present Holy Father will tend to go there on a regular basis, I believe certainly uh, before trips, right? Before and after. He always, uh, usually will stop there on the way to the airport or go there the day before. And usually on the way back into Rome, he, before he goes back to the Vatican, he goes straight to St. Mary Major to thank uh, Our Lady for the trip and uh, to ask her help on the trip. So he's, he's like clockwork with that. And uh, Joan has even uh, sent some pilgrims there who haven't had a chance to uh, to see the Pope while in Rome, mm -hmm. she'll tell them, well, he's going to be at St. Mary Major today before his trip, so if you want to see him, that's the place to go. All right, that's great. And you say this basilica is my favorite place to visit in Rome. When were you first there? Absolutely. Well, I visited St. Mary Major when I first visited Rome many, many years ago before living here. Mm -hmm. But now that I live here, it's just become a part of my uh, experience here because we as Marians, Part of our rule of life is to go to confession every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so I would usually, uh, on, uh, when, on the appointed day every couple of weeks, I'll take a walk from our house to uh, St. Mary Major, say my rosary on the way. And then there are wonderful Dominican um, confessors in there who hear confessions in all different languages. So I go to confession there. And then I go down to um, a little crypt. Uh, below mm -hmm. the uh, altar, the main altar, and there's a beautiful uh, relic of the manger where mm -hmm. uh, Jesus was born mm -hmm. uh, from Bethlehem. And so when I go down there, my name is Joseph, so I feel close to St. Joseph, close mm -hmm. to Our Lady and the child Jesus. And so it's, it's like going back to Bethlehem mm -hmm. and uh, the incarnation, the place where Jesus was born on this earth. And so it's always a sense of renewal for me, you know, after confessing my sins, you know, I'm going to get a fresh start and uh, ask the Holy Family to pray and intercede for me. And then there's a beautiful statue there of uh, Blessed Pius IX, and actually today's his feast day, uh, who proclaimed the right. dogma of the Immaculate Conception. I'm, the, uh, I'm with the Marians of the Immaculate right. Conception, so I feel like he's a, sort of like a brother to us. And he's, there's a beautiful statue of him kneeling there uh, before the manger, and so I ask his intercession as well. And he's actually buried right. at the, the Church of St. Lawrence, which isn't far from our house. Right. So I always feel like he's, uh, he's practically a member of our community. Well, you mentioned this, what uh, Mother Angelica would like to know, is the idea that uh, usually Eucharistic Adoration is one of the chapels of the Basilica. So I often pray there for a while as well. Do you see her a fair amount when you go Absolutely. to these particular shrines and 
things like that, uh, maybe more Eucharistic adoration going on than maybe there used to be? Well, uh, it was John Paul II who started the Eucharistic adoration at St. Peter's, mm -hmm. and uh, that still goes on while the uh, Basilica is open, and then St. Mary Major has had it for a long time, and I know there's a certain amount of it at uh, St. John Lateran as well. So it's really an important uh, thing that Our Lady is always leading us mm -hmm. to her son Jesus, and uh, the, the famous shrines like Fatima and Lourdes and places like that as well, is usually always Eucharistic adoration chapels there. Uh, knock as well in Ireland. Right. So um, Eucharistic adoration I think is really the, uh, a way that the Lord is using to renew His church mm -hmm. and to bring us uh, into a communion with, uh, with uh, Jesus. So uh, I think it's powerful and I've seen it in a lot of different places. You've got a beautiful picture here and, uh, and a prayer to Our Lady Queen of Peace I guess that was uh, put together by uh, St. John Paul II. So, uh, um, mm -hmm. now it's, it's kind of interesting. There's a beautiful statue in St. Right. With Our Lady yeah, with her hand up, it's kind of interesting, and the, the kind of the pose, it's very different than a lot of other ones we've seen her in. It's true. It was uh, Pope Benedict the Fifteenth uh, commissioned that uh, image of Our Lady, our Queen of Peace, uh, sitting on a throne with her son Jesus there, and uh, an olive branch, and it was at the end of the First World War, which was such a terrible war. Um, and so it was in Thanksgiving for the end of the war. Uh, but Our Lady is holding up her hand, and the pained expression on her face mm -hmm. is just very, very moving. And so Our Lady is really saying, no more war. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be killing each other. Right. And so I always uh, say a prayer at the, that, uh, before that image of Our Lady, because it's such a right. powerful one uh, that uh, you know, Mary's children are killing each other, and she right. doesn't want that. She wants to, to love each other. Right, the war to stop. Uh, now you've got uh, the Spanish yeah. Steps, and then we move on to something. Now this was uh, seems somewhat obscure to someone like me. Saint Andrew of the Thickets. Oh yes. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful church. Um, I mean, we have to see Rome a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, three hundred years ago. It wasn't all uh, you know concrete and then sidewalks and city. That was uh, just outside, even though it's now in the center of Rome, it was just outside the historic center at that time. So it was in the thickets, it was in the sort of the, the bush. There was actually uh, trees uh, around that church when it was first um, uh, built. Mm -hmm. And so that's why uh, it's, it's called that. And inside there, there was a one, there's a beautiful image of Our Lady on one of the side altars that was originally dedicated to St. Michael the Archangel. Mm -hmm. And there, a famous Jewish banker, agnostic, named uh, Ratisbon in the 19th century, mm -hmm. uh, he ended up wearing the Miraculous Medal even though he didn't believe in it. Mm -hmm. And Our Lady ended up appearing to him there, and he had a tremendous conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then he ended up becoming a Catholic, becoming a priest, and going to the Holy Land, and uh, working among the, uh, the Jews in the Holy Land for the rest of his life. Right. And Maximilian mm -hmm. Kolbe, as a seminarian, had heard that story, and so he would go to that church, and he had the inspiration to found the uh, Militia Immaculata there. Oh. And then finally, when he was ordained, he studied here in Rome. Uh, he wanted to celebrate his first Mass there. So it's uh, called the Our Lady. Uh, it's a miraculous image of Our Lady. Many, many graces have come from that image. People go there all the time. And the whole orientation of the church now is, is skewered. So when you walk into the church, uh, the chairs are not facing the main altar, but that side altar, because everybody wants to... Uh, mm. Uh, ask Our Lady's intercession at that beautiful side altar. So it's it's been right. called, become like the the Lords of Rome, they call it. Right, the Madonna of the Miracle. I think you you mentioned here is kind yeah. of the, the reference as well. And I know we showed that image moments ago. And and likewise, uh, a church, Our Lady on the Way. What about that? One? Yes. That's a wonderful uh, uh, church. Uh, I had passed it many times on the bus, and I had heard uh, there's, a, there's a well con connected with this uh, church, and uh, people had said, you have to go in there, you have to go in there. I hadn't seen it. Joan told me the same thing, you have to get there. So I finally did for the book. And there's a wonderful story where there was a well there. Uh, it was a place where there were like stables, and the uh, assistant to a, a bishop had taken this image of Our Lady for some reason. Uh, it was on a terracotta brick. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know if he did it on purpose or accidentally, but he ended up throwing that image of Our Lady down the well. Mm -hmm. And so because it was a terracotta brick, it, it naturally began to sink in the water. 
but God does not want his, uh, <laughs> Jesus does not want his mother to be disrespected. So miraculously, there was like an effusion of this water, like a, a, um, a volcano erupting, mm -hmm. and the image came back up to the top, and, and the water was like a fountain there mm -hmm. uh, coming out of this well, and Our Lady was just sitting there on top, that image on the terracotta brick. So the bishop was very moved, and he took that image, and they saved it, and they did a whole canonical process, and they discovered it was a miraculous uh, occurrence. So now that image of Our Lady is on the, uh, the wall there on one of the side chapels. You can still bring, drink water from that well. And so now there are many healings uh, attributed to that image of Our Lady and, uh, and the water that came out of that well. So it's a wonderful story. Now you also have the catacombs of Priscilla. Now is that considered then like a shrine or how does that fit into this book? Well, it's one of the catacombs in uh, Rome. Uh, it uh, happens to be located somewhat close to our house, uh, where our uh, general headquarters are. There were many, many uh, saints discovered in that, uh, uh, those catacombs mm -hmm. through the years, uh, but now their remains have been moved to some of the other churches there. So now you can visit those catacombs, uh, but the remains of the saints are no longer there. Uh, but it uh, has the original image, the oldest image of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a beautiful fresco there from the Old Testament uh, talking about um, the, the prophet Balaam is pointing to the, the star, that the, Jesus will be that star that, uh, that will bring hope to the world. And so there's an Old Testament mm -hmm. picture of this prophet from the Old Testament and then Our Lady holding her, the child Jesus and uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy. So the oldest image of Our Lady known uh, can be seen in those catacombs. Right. So those catacombs become very right. important to us as Marians. We've celebrated Mass right. there on uh, special occasions because of that ancient image of Our Lady. Have you found that uh, that has an impact not only on Catholics, but certainly, let's say, Protestants whose view of Mary may be lower uh, than ours tend to be in the sense of seeing how early on she was being honored by the first Christians? Yeah, uh, you know, I think some of the Protestant uh, understanding would be that if we give any kind of honor to Mary, that's going to take uh, honor away from Jesus. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother, Jesus would certainly want to honor his mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary's whole um, vocation, her whole purpose is to lead us to her son Jesus. She doesn't want to be the center of attention. She wants to lead us to her son Jesus. And so uh, it's interesting to think about Protestants coming to Rome, seeing all these images of Our Lady, and uh, what do, must they think? Uh, we're not uh, making an idol out of her. We're not putting her on a level with God. Uh, she is a creature like us, mm -hmm. and yet uh, she responded to God's graces in such a powerful way that she gives us a beautiful example of what it means to live the Christian life mm -hmm. to the fullness. Uh, and so. Mary is only wants to lead us to Jesus, so she's right. never going to take away from her son. She just wants to point us in the right direction. Right, exactly. Now, uh, as we're winding down, there's Our Lady of Peace. Now, this is a church that's located near Piazza Navona, uh, and anybody who usually goes to Rome, if you go to one piazza, that's the one particular one that's kind of within walking distance easily. Yeah, Piazza uh, from from the Vatican, etc. So a lot of people go there and end up. Uh, eating uh, a meal uh, in, in that piazza. But there's also a miraculous image uh, tied into this? That's right. In that uh, church, which is very close to that beautiful square where people go, as you said, for coffee and to see the artists and the mm -hmm. jugglers and all kinds of things in the evening. Uh, but if you go during the day to Our Lady of Peace, apparently in the 15th century, uh, there was a man who lost money at uh, gambling and uh, so he was passing the entrance of a church, and there was an image of Our Lady there, and he was so upset that he had lost all this money that he took a dagger and he stabbed the image of Our Lady four times in anger and in frustration. But again, God does not like to see his mother dishonored, mm -hmm. and so this image of Our Lady began to miraculously bleed. Mm -hmm. And so again, the um, uh, investigation was done and the process was uh, uh, carried out, and the Pope eventually uh, declared that this was a miracle. And so now this uh, chapel was uh, um, set up to uh, have this miraculous image of Our Lady. It's now called Our Lady of Peace uh, because she doesn't want that violence and that, uh, that fighting. Uh, and so she became a, a symbol for us again of peace. 
uh, Our Lady trying to bring us back to ourselves and uh, our, our more civilized uh, who, who we should be. Right. Now that's Rome Pilgrimage with Mary, beautiful, beautiful book with uh, Father Joe's insights and our good friend, of course, as well, our Rome Bureau Chief there, Joan Lewis. Uh, her insights are there. And just before we go, Father, the other book you're working on has to do with what? The same kind of format and its focus will be? Uh, the Images of Our Lady in France. Uh, we went to Lourdes and La Salette and uh, Pont Men and the uh, Miraculous Medal uh, uh, Chapel in uh, Paris. And so we're hoping that it'll come out uh, later this year. A, a beautiful uh, experience that was to uh, go to those shrines and see these Images of Our Lady. Okay, very good. Well, of course, uh, we'll look forward to that and hopefully get a chance to interview you when that book comes out. We'll look forward to you as well every year when you're working out of Stockbridge and carrying divine mercy and the wonderful work that the MICs do throughout uh, the church and throughout the year. Thank you so much, Father Joe Roche, for joining us from Rome. And the book, of course, is Rome, A Pilgrimage with Mary, uh, a beautiful, beautiful book available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. EWTNRC.com is the place to buy it. And uh, thank you so much for joining us for the special international bookmark. I'm Doug Keck. Join us next time, and we'll see you. Thanks.